Um, but so we are going to go straight into our second paper at this time, um, which will be brought to us by Tim Poyer. Um, he is the vice director and archivist of the LNG White Estate at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, where he has served since 1981. In addition to articles and contributions in the LNG White Encyclopedia and other publications, he is the general editor of the LNG White Letters and Manuscripts with Annotation Series. And his paper today is titled In Context, A Brief Overview of the LNG White Estate Letters and Manuscripts Annotation Project. And Tim, you have 45 minutes. And again, I'll give you a two minute warning towards the end. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And good day to everyone. Morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you may be joining us with this um, symposium. I will be uh, sharing a uh, slideshow for my remarks. And uh, Daniela, you can confirm for me, please, that it is sharing um, for the viewers in a moment here. It is sharing, yes. Thank you. I'm going to first give a introduction then some background for the annotation project. Talk about its methodology, look at an example, and then consider the possible options for the future. There are two sentences that were spoken by Ellen White that are now quite familiar, but they were lost for more than 70 years in the forgotten minutes of a 1902 school board meeting. The discussion centered on Ellen White's counsel on what age children should begin school. Church members were very familiar with what she had written in the testimonies that parents should be the only teachers of their children until they reached age eight or 10 years of age. That instruction carried the day until the meeting mentioned above when the idea of beginning a kindergarten sponsored by the St. Helena Sanitarium Church in California was being considered. In Ellen White's remarks to the board members, she pointed out that there was not a Sabbath keeping school when that light was given to me. She then went on to make the following statements. Circumstances alter conditions. Circumstances change the relation of things. I suspect that everyone agrees that Ellen White's writings, and particularly her counsels, need to be contextualized, not only linguistically, but also historically. We just were talking about that in the previous presentation. Some might think that we only came to recognize this need in more recent decades, maybe since the 1960s or 70s. But consider this statement by W.C. White written to Guy Dale, the secretary of the Central European Division in 1929. And I thank Dr. Kaiser for bringing this statement to my attention back in 2016. W.C. White wrote, I believe as you do that such a setting forth of circumstances under which testimonies were given or the history of the time in which they were given would be exceedingly valuable to our people. I will promise to do my best to encourage the General Conference Committee to appoint a working committee of three to take this matter in hand. It is unfortunate that nothing was ever formulated to carry out such a project. For either the nine volumes of the testimonies for the church or for any of Ellen White's writings. We could say that Arthur White's six volume biography of Ellen White comes the closest. And thankfully, we also have the Ellen White Encyclopedia to aid in giving better understanding. Fast forward now from 1929 to 1991. That was the year in which the White Estate trustees took an unprecedented action to begin bringing Ellen White's unpublished letters and manuscripts into some sort of standardized form so that they might begin publishing them in chronological order starting with the earliest years. Recognizing the amount of work that this would require, their action was accompanied by a request to the General Conference for financial assistance so that a team of two could begin the work. And they estimated that the work could be completed within 10 years or less. Two years later, 
After further review of the collection, the board considered whether the anticipated publication should include ordinary letters to family members and strongly worded testimonies about certain individuals with their complete identities. After some discussion, a consensus was reached that everything should be included, but for the proper introduction. This was reaffirmed in 1997 with the expectation that the materials might be published on CD-ROM with appropriate annotations by the White Estate staff. By February 2000, an experimental CD-ROM was being tested and the board approved making the searchable database of Ellen White's unpublished letters and manuscripts available at White Estate branch offices and research centers. But it was also noted that questions had arisen over the past two or three years about the wisdom of making the entire collection publicly available without annotation and explanatory notes helping the readers to understand the historical context for many of those strongly worded letters. The discussion concluded with a vote to move forward with annotating the material and to request financial support from the General Conference in light of the thousands of letters involved. On March 21, 2002, the White Estate Board approved a proposal for a 12-month pilot program to begin the annotation process and suggested the name of historian Dr. Roland Carlman to lead the assignment. Dr. Carlman was the director of the Ellen White SDA Research Center at Newbold College in England. Later that year, an annotation supervisory committee was set up by the board and Dr. Carlman began his work on a part-time basis with a part-time student assistant. The next year, Dr. Carlman presented a progress report to the trustees leading to questions about the level of annotation expected and what it was practically possible to do in view of the magnitude of the collection, some 8,100 documents. Dr. Carlman pointed out that standards exist for annotation projects of this type and recommended that the White Estate stay as close as possible to established standards. He suggested two major categories of annotations. First, addressing unknown, unclear, or misunderstood phrases. And second, providing background information on the recipients, such as family connections, location, and external events relating to a letter's message. The very real and practical question was raised as to what could actually be accomplished given the money, staffing, and time required for the project. It was agreed that at a minimum, the recipients of every letter should be identified, adding, if possible, a brief biography of each addressee. Beyond that, three possible levels of annotation were proposed, each with increasing details. It was eventually decided to annotate most of the documents on a level one scale, but allow Dr. Carlman to move to a higher level as needed in consultation with the supervisory committee. He was also invited to begin full-time work on the project beginning in July, 2003. Over the next 10 years, updates on the annotation project were regularly reported to the White Estate Board. The magnitude of the assignment became increasingly evident. At one meeting, I noted to the trustees that even if we could reach the pace where we, where we were annotating one document every day, seven days a week, it would take more than 22 years to complete the project. Some of the challenges include the following. A large number of Ellen White's early letters are undated, requiring additional research to determine the approximate time of writing. There are roughly 30,000 incoming letters to Ellen White in her office that needed to be reviewed for providing context and responses. 
Many individuals are identified only by their first names in the documents. And the paucity of Adventist sources in the 1840s to 60s. By 2008, Dr. Carlman had completed all the annotations for the documents to be included in the first volume, which covered years 1845 to 1859. While that was being copy edited at the Review and Herald, the biographical sketches still needed to be completed, as well as introductory historical articles written. In 2011, Dr. Carlman, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Kaiser, at that time a doctoral student at Andrews University, was enlisted to provide part-time assistance to Dr. Carlman, who had been the sole annotator for the project. With volume one now at the press, work on the second volume covering 1860 to 63 began. However, when Dr. Carlman announced his plan to retire after 2012, the trustees turned to Stanley Hickerson to serve as chief annotator. And Stanley continued in that role until his untimely death in 2016 after which Dr. Kaiser completed the annotations for the second volume, which is now at the press. The annotation methodology. One of the first questions that needed to be addressed in the annotation effort was what would constitute the source documents. The letter and manuscript collection inherited by the trustees of Ellen White's estate consists of typescripts made by Ellen White's secretaries under her direction, to which have been added typescripts made by the White State staff from handwritten documents that were still untranscribed at the time of her death in 1915, making a total of approximately 50,000 typewritten pages. Ellen White preserved original holographs, handwritten originals, for roughly one-fourth of those documents. Quoting now from the first annotation volume, while an entirely new transcription retaining the grammatical idiosyncrasies and archaisms of the original documents might have been attempted for this series, several factors led to the decision to utilize the existing transcriptions. These included practical considerations, such as the magnitude and prohibitive cost of retranscribing tens of thousands of manuscript pages and the fact that the current transcriptions are universally used in the many publications in which Ellen White manuscript material is found. More fundamental was the desire to present a text for the general reader that, while remaining true to the meaning and wording of the original manuscripts, was free of the distractions of grammatical imperfections and transcription apparatus. Accordingly, the Ellen White text for the volumes used the existing transcripts. But this was not done uncritically. Quoting again from that volume, in order to ascertain the reliability of the current transcriptions, a sampling of documents was compared against their handwritten or earliest sources. That examination confirmed that the copyists uniformly opted for what is sometimes called expanded transcription in order to improve the readability and clarity of the original. Thus, while remaining true to the meaning and language of the original documents, they corrected or modernized spelling, punctuation, capitalization, verb tenses, spelled out abbreviations, and inserted paragraph indentations. They also standardized the date and place lines of each letter. Further, it was decided to include scans of several Ellen White holographs in the volume so that interested readers could compare the transcribed text with the handwritten original and observe the degree of editing involved. Each annotator, Dr. Carlman, Stanley Hickerson, and Dr. Kaiser, established his own systems and procedures for research and annotation, but the essential elements included the following. Create a timeline of Ellen White's activities. Ascertain dates and places of writing of the documents. 
Where there is a holograph, compare the transcription and correct if necessary. Identify relevant records in other Ellen White and non-Ellen White correspondence, diaries, church records, publications. Where known, note outcomes resulting from the instruction, predictions, or warnings of a letter. Define archaic vocabulary and expressions. Identify quotations or allusions to the Bible, hymns, poetry, or other sources. Note any instances of literary borrowing. Identify key potentially problematic or misunderstood passages. Create an ongoing file or index of names that are mentioned. Confirm, and don't just assume, identities where only first names or initials are supplied. And the same was done with the passages in Testimonies for the Church or Spiritual Gifts Volume 2, where there's just initials. Research archival and genealogical sources to confirm identities, family relations, and prepare biographical sketches. Identify and index events mentioned, visions, meetings, travels. Create a comprehensive chronological list of Ellen White's publications, articles, books, as well as her letters and manuscripts. That item alone is of great value to have a single chronological listing, whether she wrote a letter, a review article, a passage in the testimonies, to have a complete chronological list. Comment on, his, on significant historical and theological advances. Note how Ellen White's views compare and contrast with those of her contemporaries. Create maps of Ellen White's itineraries. Compile geographical materials and information about relevant locations. Create a bibliography of primary and secondary literature that's cited in the volume. And write a short sentence or two summary, an abstract, if you will, of the content of each document. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the first volume of annotations, I'm showing a sample from volume two that's coming out uh, hopefully by June of this year. This is letter 6, 1861. You can see the formatting is that is done with the date and place. And note that the letter is addressed simply to Dear Sister Mary. So the first question, the first task of the annotator was, who's Sister Mary? As you read later through the letter, it becomes evident um, with her husband, John, and other facts mentioned that it's Mary Loughborough. But that, again, is not taken for granted. So if that is the identification first of the recipient. You'll see the line that talks about where the letter had appeared in print or portions of it previously. And then in italics, a short summary of the content of that letter. If we go to the next page. Uh, you'll see, actually, just go back a moment to the previous page. You'll see in the line where it reads uh, third from the last in her first paragraph, we are rather cluttered up, but in two weeks shall be permanently settled. That's a kind of statement that's puzzling. What, means, what does she mean by being cluttered up and being permanently settled? So the footnote talks about how the whites were building an extension to their home at Wood Street in Battle Creek. Let's go over the next page or two. Let's go to the next page. Um, here you have the names that are mentioned in the text, brother and sister Lockwood, Eliza Wagner, each of those, and Brother Andrews, the old Brother Andrews. She mentions in the paragraph on the right, Mary, you write about quoted skirts, that it's wrong to wear heavy skirts. My answer you will see in the next paper. Oh, well, did she actually write something in the paper? But note 13 refers you to the article in the review where she addresses that question. And she says, I agree with the sister. If we discard hoops, it's wrong to put on heavy clothes 
to make it appear as near like hoops as possible. We know that it is injurious to wear heavy clothes. So I took a little research to again determine where she is following through on a comment she makes in this letter to Mary. Let's go to the next page. Again, more names that are identified. Talks about the baby's graves in the third paragraph on the left. Baby's graves, or what baby's graves? Well, Teresa Loughborough, daughter of John and Mary, had died almost about the same time as John Herbert White, and that's expressed in the annotations. Next page, please write often, give my love to Lucila. Again, a host of names. This was so common in her letters to just list people and give greetings at the end. Um, the question was, should all of those be identified? Should we just pass them by? Probably was decided to identify the names where possible. And then she ends the letter, love to yourself and John. But what I did not display here is also the biographical sketch for John Loughborough and Mary Loughborough that's included in the back of the volume. And Loughborough's three wives, obviously not all at the same time, but three wives. And the focus of the, of the biographical sketches is on their particular connection with Ellen White. Obviously, there are fuller sketches of these key individuals in the encyclopedia, both the SDA and the Ellen White. So the particular emphasis in the biographical sketches of the annotation volume is how they interacted with Ellen White and her testimonies letters to them. Okay, back to our presentation. In addition to the annotations themselves, the supervisory committee decided that readers would benefit from introductory articles, providing a broader context of issues and events that are contended with during the years covered in each volume. These would include a biographical summary of Ellen White's life during those specific years, as well as general articles on such topics as the shut door, religious, religious enthusiasm, the struggle toward organization, American Civil War, and early health reform activity. These were ordinarily written by specialists other than the annotator. And the final steps in the volume before publication included the selection of illustrations, the creation of an index, and board appointed readers to review the manuscript. And the index um, as well is very useful in indexing all of the visions and travels of Ellen White during those years. Now the question comes about the future. Will there be a volume three, volume four, volume 50? After what was anticipated to take perhaps two years, ended up actually taking 10 for only the first volume and another 10 for the second volume, due largely to transitions among the annotators, the question naturally arises whether there is interest and support both financially and personnel-wise to continue the series beyond 1863. Ideally, there would be a team of Adventist scholars working simultaneously to annotate the collection. It would also be wonderful to see the published testimonies for the church similarly annotated. Regarding interest, the reality is that of the 5,000 copies of volume one that were printed in 2014, less than 2,000 have been sold over the past 10 years. The series appears to meet the interests of only a specialized readership. But that lack of general interest does not diminish the importance of readers who access these documents that are now online, having a proper contextualization for what they are reading. This is critical for proper hermeneutics and contemporary application. One possibility moving forward is to enlist scholars in doing some sort of online crowdsourcing annotation of the documents while employing a supervisory annotator whose primary responsibility would be to review and approve or improve 
the annotations that were being suggested by these contributors. Because the full range of years is already published and online, annotations for any document from any year could be contributed for review. Under this scenario, scholars in the South Pacific might focus on documents from 1891 to 1900 when Ellen White served in Australia and New Zealand, while specialists in Europe might annotate at the same time the years she spent in Britain and the continent, 1885 to 1887. This is just one possibility. Others involve uh, students, doctoral students in Adventist studies at our schools. Circumstances do change the relation of things, and that's no less the case in considering the best options for the future on how to present the highly valued content of this unique collection most helpfully. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our respondent is going to be Jon Stefansson. Jon is a systematic theologian who did his doctorate at the Free University of Amsterdam. His dissertation analyzed the dynamics of prophetic interpretation, including one chapter on Ellen White. He has compiled several bibliographies for the James White Library and Freedom South Adventist University. Um, and Jon, you have 10 minutes. All right, now I'm unmuted, so you should be able to hear me. Uh, I'll just go right into it. Uh, Mr. Tim Poyer has presented us with a succinct, clear, and a helpful overview of the White Estates Letter and Manuscripts Annotation Project. And as all other ground research, the annotation project is painstaking, slow, and often works like this go unnoticed or taken for granted. And the attempt itself may even be very daunting for those who are participating. Just as an example, it took 120 years to prepare a comprehensive critical edition of Martin, of Martin Luther. And yet, these are the kinds of works that benefit untold number of people. So an overview of the history and methodology of this vital, vital project is welcomed and will hopefully be widely read. Now I'm going to summarize uh, what we heard, uh, just to put then my uh, comments um, put fresh in your mind. Uh, Poyer strikes the main court of his presentation uh, right off the bat with the anecdote of Ellen White and the school board in California. In that story, White points out that what she had to say has to be understood in context. The need to clarify the context of her writings was already felt shortly after her death, as, as well as uh, W.C. White wrote in 1929. An official project, however, only began to take shape in the 1990s. At that time, the White Estate uh, trustees decided to publish White's unpublished letters and manuscripts in their entirety, and the intention was to do so uh, annotated. Uh, so far, the annotation project has been going on for 20 years. We have seen or will be seeing now the second volume uh, later this year. And these two volumes together cover 20 years or so of Ellen White's writings. So almost a year for each of her uh, writing years. And there have been three annotators who have worked on the project. And the transfer of the project from one annotator to another has obviously uh, slowed down its speed. Um, Boyer then explained the annotation methodology. Uh, as a general rule, it was decided to use the transcription that is already available, that was uh, done by White's secretaries and the White estate staff. And this is done to save time and just be practical uh, with the limited resources available, so energy can be focused on the annotation itself. And I'm going to refer to the paper on the list of elements included in the methodology. 
Hoyer then concludes his overview with a glance towards the future of the project. Um, and of course, here, as with many scholarly projects, we hear of the familiar um, set of problems that often beset academic uh, projects. Um, there isn't enough time, money, personal, sales are somewhat disappointing or slow, and there is not it's not necessarily a bestseller. Uh, but the work is important and invaluable and must go on. Uh, Poyer canvases a couple of things that could uh, maybe be utilized in the future, like geographically specified teams of scholars working on uh, different eras in Ellen White's uh, writing or places, and also using crowdsourcing as a tool in annotation. Now, uh, to my assessment. Um, I think the overview is informative, clear, and succinct. Uh, the history and methodology are accurately described, as can be expected, since Poyer is the general editor of the annotation project. Uh, my recommendations all therefore have to do not so much with um, deleting stuff or even correcting stuff, or, but rather maybe expounding on things here and there. And hopefully some of my uh, thoughts will be he helpful and just not me riding a ho hobby horse into my own uh, wild west. So the annotation project exists because of the need to contextualize. Uh, perhaps it would be helpful to emphasize this need a, a bit more, uh, because though adjuncts in general probably come against this need all the time while reading or studying wide, I would guess that often uh, the readership might be only half conscious of this problem. Many believers have personal stories of how reading white in a, with a misunderstanding or with a colored lens has actually shaped uh, quite a large part of their religious experience. So annotation is not just a curiosity for scholars, it can have life altering consequences if it helps someone to understand uh, the writings better, and in that sense can be a, a blessing to many people. Now, I have a sense that um, many church members might be guarded against annotation uh, while they might need it the most. Uh, this might be because uh, Adventists see Ellen White as inspired, and a piece of writing can hardly get more interesting or important than that, being written by someone who claimed inspiration, and the more important the text is, the more necessary uh, it is to understand it uh, well, but also very controversial uh, in how, how it should be done. So church members may be afraid that scholars are maybe reading white for them, and, and maybe this is a, a misunderstanding that could be disarmed. And that might maybe be done in part by, and that would be my other point, by tracing the history of this need a bit uh, further. Um, and so so that the readership could see how the how the desire to contextualize to contextualize Ellen White's writings are rooted in the wishes of the author initially itself herself. Contextualization is related to commentary because both seek to clarify the text, but the need for clarif clarification is immediate. Just immediately when something has been written, we might need clarification of what it means, but this need takes the form of contextualization a bit uh, slower uh, because we understand our present better than something written a long time ago. And therefore we just started the major of Adventist studies what, almost two centuries after we started as, um, as a denomination. So just a few points uh, on what could maybe be included in showing how, how this developed, the need for clarification. White herself already uh, often needed to explain her own writings to her contemporaries and fellow believers. An early example would be the chapter explanation in early writings that dates back in part to 1854. Um, the establishment of the White Estate and White's wish that, uh, that maybe even compilations would be published and they are in a sense uh, made to clarify a topic by bringing together various writings on one theme. 
uh, at some point in time, uh, the wider state, and maybe it happened before, I don't know, the book started to have short introductions that canvas uh, maybe the background of the writing, the, the themes, common misunderstandings, and so forth. And while uh, Boyer mentioned uh, somewhat maybe critical scholars uh, of the later part of the 20th century, it might maybe be interesting also to probe why was there such a pause? If this was realized so early in the 20th century, why did it take us so long to do it uh, or to start doing it? And here maybe, for example, the role of Ellen White's writings, the theology of inspiration and controversies concerning that might play a role. Um, as, may, as, for example, Dr. Michael Campbell's research on the 1919 Bible conference suggests that uh, leaders might, might have been somewhat wary of dealing with all these details with uh, membership in general uh, until we were kind of maybe forced to do it later when, the, when we were faced with difficult questions by our own scholars. Uh, on, on the methodology and future uh, the future glance, I have have mostly just uh, questions and maybe suggestions, so I'll try to list them here um, shortly. I wrote here three. Uh, first, are there any plans on combining the various lists of each volume so that not just a piece of list is in one volume and then in another? Maybe it's possible to do like master lists, several of them that would be available and searchable online. Um, second, would it be possible to use mapping with the research that has already been done uh, that wouldn't require so much of extra work since probably computer savvy people would be the ones who would be doing most of the data entry, but the research is already there. For example, Ellen White's itineraries, uh, some platform like, I don't know, Google Maps, for example, could be used to visualize some of this data and even maybe where letters were written and where to they were addressed, something like this. And third, and this is maybe just uh, daydreaming, but if annotation will actually continue and will grow, maybe including the testimonies as well, as well, and they are probably the main published work penned by White that is in need of annotation, right? Um, would it be possible to maybe try to uh, pitch um, sponsorship to um, potential sponsors uh, under the umbrella of evangelism. I know that many rich uh, adjuntist uh, businessmen, they are interested in raising churches, um, sponsoring campaigns and stuff, but not always as maybe interested in, uh, in academic work. But a massive problem that we have in evangelism is the back door, right? Many people leave. And therefore, the early stages of discipleship, or what is called sometimes follow-up, is very vital uh, in settling or establishing members in, in the community and in, in the teachings. And, and Alan White is probably a vital component in that, in helping uh, members or new members in, in understanding her correctly. So maybe it could be pitched as this is indeed uh, part of evangelism. It's not just for our academics and for our theology professors, but this is done with the intention of helping members, um, you know, thrive in and stay in the church. Uh, finally, I want to thank Poyer for his paper. And I wish him and his team ever increasing success and ever increasing resources and God's further blessing in the annotation project because it is a great and important work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Tim, I don't know if you want to respond. Yes, uh, I took note of each of those suggestions. They're excellent, especially. Um, the fact of how Ellen White herself used um, opportunities to explain what she wrote and that passage, uh, that chapter on explanation in uh, early writings is a great example. 
also thinking of the appendix notes that she had in her great controversy as well, uh, showing the need for context. So I appreciate the remarks. Uh, I've jotted them all down and we hope that the project will see a continuing future. Thank you very much.